Dr. Megan Rabuli is an assistant professor of pediatrics at UNC Chapel Hill. She got her BS and PhD from NC State, and then she did her postdoctoral training at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, her research is focused on respiratory toxicology, and she investigates how inhaled pollutants affect airway health. Um, Megan and I work in the same lab group, and we've been working together now for a few years, so I'm really excited for you all to hear her speak about vaping and respiratory infections. Yeah, I'm really excited to do this, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm going to try and monitor the chat. Um, but if Elise and Dana could help as well, that would be fantastic. And if you have questions um, while I'm going through and you want to interrupt, I'm totally fine with that too. All right. So uh, this talk is um, going to be on e-cigarettes and respiratory infections. And so this is a new and emerging area of research. And it's really exciting to be kind of at the forefront of what we know about the toxicity of a relatively uh, new consumer product, which is really neat. So a little bit of background. Um, on average, the human, uh, human takes in about, in about 20,000 breaths per day. So that's approximately 10,000 liters of air. And as you can see, uh, from this nice image of someone coughing or sneezing, suspended in the air are millions of microbes, which is kind of illustrated by this picture, including potential pathogens. And so the first kind of interactive piece for this is what I want you to identify some of these potential pathogens. So please place in the chat some types of microbes that you think can be transmitted in the air. And if you don't know the particular microbe names, you can also share diseases or infections that might be caused by these microbes. Yep, definitely. Tuberculosis, strep, pneumonia, common cold, which is uh, RSV. Yes, there are bacteria that travel in the air too. Um, if you think about uh, work from prior presentations, which may have include, included information on your microbiome, there are tons of microbes and bacteria that live and breed and um, exist in your airway as well as in your mouth. So you can definitely transmit that through the air, through coughing and sneezing. Awesome. Coronavirus. Yes. Very relevant for today. Awesome. Cool. Well, you guys covered a lot of the uh, microbes that are potentially transmitted in the air. You're spot on. Um, so some of these you guys identified, I'm going to add those. I've added those here and they include uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID virus, um, influenza, as well as tuberculosis, and then some of the other ones that you all mentioned. And some of these bugs can cause mild colds, but others can also cause serious disease, like we know from COVID-19 and sometimes from the flu. Um, microbes also typically enter uh, through the mouth and the nose to reach the lower airway. And so you can um, inhale them through your nose as well as through your mouth. And this is two potential routes of entry. Um, according to the WHO, uh, the respiratory tract infections are responsible for 4 million plus deaths worldwide. And it causes a lot of respiratory disease and which contributes to morbidity as well across the globe. And so it's a huge, um, global effort to kind of understand better what induces susceptibility to respiratory infections and to try and come up with ways to prevent and mitigate some of these adverse events like death and disease. So the respiratory tract um, is a first line of defense against pathogens um, and, pathog and disease causing pathogens in particular. And so you can see here that there is a, um, an image of an H&E stain, and this is what the respiratory epithelium looks like when you dissect it. Um, so the top layer of cells, which include goblet cells um, that are ciliated, uh, are on the top, and they're followed by um, seromucosal glands, which produce mucus in the airway, which we all kind of feel and know about a little better whenever we have a cold or an allergy. Um, and they also are producing mucus uh, through these goblet cells. And so that contributes to a mucus layer. And this mucus layer um, is really pro potentially protective. 
but also in the airway are these uh, innate immune cells and they include neutrophils, macrophages, and NK cells. And they kind of live in this mucosal layer as well as in the um, subepithelial layer. And they're constantly surveilling for different kinds of pathogens or things that shouldn't be in the airway in order to take care of them. Um, so engulf them or uh, inactivate them so that they don't affect the body and end up causing disease. Uh, so this is uh, a time where I'm going to ask Dana to activate a Zoom poll question. And uh, the question states, which of these are not part of the respiratory tract initial defense against pathogens? And I covered some of these, but I wanna see what you all think. A little recall from biology class. So Dana, if you wanna go ahead and leave that open for a minute or two and we can close it and reveal what everyone's answers were. Almost there, we got about 72% have voted. Okay. All right, got six more people now. All right, last call for votes. We still have, there we go. All right, you guys are spot on. Yes, the B and the T cells are typically part of the adaptive immune response which comes after the initial kind of wave of the innate immune defenses, which include mucus and cilia and innate immune cells, as well as um, different proteins and surfactants, as well as defensins that are present in the airway. So goblet cells uh, produce mucus in the epithelial cell layers. Cilia, which you've probably seen from talks previously, I think Philip Clapp covered this, that cilia are uh, produced by these epithelial cells and they beat mucus up and out of the airway, and it's often referred to as a mucociliary escalator. And combine these two uh, work to prevent pathogens from reaching the lower airway and causing over uh, lower airway disease. But there are other, other mucosal defenses included, including secreted antibodies, which kind of float around in the mucus, peptides called defensins, which also exist in the mucosal layer, as well as these innate immune cells, like I mentioned earlier, that help surveil and take out these pathogens when they're detected. So our group is primarily interested in these bottom two. We look a lot at secreted antibodies um, and secreted uh, cytokines and chemokines, as well as innate immune cells and their function in order to better determine how these toxicants are altering the natural innate immune response to infection and in inducing potential increased susceptibility. So um, when a pathogen is detected, uh, by cellular receptors or interacts with the cell. And that's kind of illustrated here where we have a pathogen interacting with an innate immune cell, but they can also interact with epithelial cells, which is kind of how COVID works. Um, the, the cells that they're interacting with um, or they're entering release signaling molecules that are typically called cytokines and chemokines, but other things as well can be um, emitted. And these cytokines and chemokines signal locally and to the circulation uh, to involve other types of cells and other actions of other types of cells, like signaling neighboring cells to put up extra, extra protective barriers, um, signaling infected cells to die, to try and prevent further um, spread of the potential pathogen that's entering the cell and potentially replicating, as well as recruitment of white blood cells to stimulating uh, to stimulate long lasting immunity. So you're trying to develop your adaptive immune system uh, pretty much immediately after coming in contact with a pathogen uh, in the first place. And these signals trigger um, a variety of measures elsewhere in the body too, to help to deal with the infection. And sometimes you um, induce fever or cough or other cold-like symptoms. Um, and that's part of that innate immune response to help try and prevent, protect your body. So we study this initial response to pathogens, including markers of viral replication, uh, to look at susceptibility to infection, uh, signaling molecule production like cytokines and chemokines, and you'll hear those words quite a bit uh, through the rest of the presentation, as well as antibody prevalence. So there are antibodies that are present uh, within your respiratory tract uh, kind of prior to any kind of infection, but there are also virus and bacterial specific antibodies that help uh, protect our body 
after we've come in contact uh, with either a vaccine or a pathogen for the first time, and that's generated by your innate immune system. And that can kind of be a signal for how well someone's immune memory works, which is also really important. So why do people respond differently to uh, respiratory infections? From the COVID-19 epidemic, we know that uh, people respond differently to respiratory infections, right? I mean, we know that some people experience really mild symptoms and hardly even notice that they have COVID. And then there are people that end up on respirators in the hospital and die. And the infection is the same across all individuals. It's how our body responds to that infection that's really different. So what drives differences in responses? So this is another time I'm gonna ask for some um, uh, active participation. So please place in the chat any kind of factor that you think may influence a response to a respiratory infection. Yes, autoimmune um, conditions, definitely. So uh, like a subactive immune system will definitely influence responses. A history of smoking, uh, definitely we know influences response to viral infection and potentially vaping. And that's kind of what our experiments will cover today. Um, age and overall health, yes, definitely. We know the elderly are more susceptible to viral infections in particular, um, COVID as well as influenza. BMI can also be a factor. Yes, definitely smoking. It's definitely obvious from this presentation you guys have caught on. Um, genetics and overall health, definitely. Environment, yes. Uh, stress levels, stress levels can also influence response to viral infection. And yes, virus strain can definitely influence that as well. Um, that's kind of an extrinsic factor that we can't really control in our uh, um, response to viral infection, but it's definitely good to be aware that different viral strains can induce uh, responses, variable responses to viral infection. Yes, of an underlying disease definitely uh, can influence this response as well. Uh, so to kind of uh, get at what we think about as a toxicologist and immunologist when we're thinking about viral infections, we know that our body tries to maintain homeostasis, so a nice balance in our immune system of what's going on. Um, and there is potential for extra immune activation, which can potentially cause um, lung damage. And so that's extra inflammation that can potentially induce uh, fibrosis as well as other like barrier um, integrity problems and induce damage in the airway. And there's also this immune suppression, which is potentially a problem. And we can see that as a potential driver of a susceptibility to infection. And so when we're thinking about how toxicants, inhaled toxicants like cigarette smoke and e-cigarettes influence this response to viral infection, we're really, really looking at clues of how uh, these products may induce this immune suppression. So I kind of gave away the key early here. So factors of interest to respiratory toxicologists in particular include lots of things that are in the environment. So here I'm showing pictures of a manufacturing plant to kind of represent just general air pollution, a picture of a smoking fire. Um, if you'll think about the wildfire situation in California in the past few years, there are lots of people that are exposed to wildfire smoke as well as other components that are in uh, the forest being burned like plastics and metals um, that may contribute to altered response to viral infection. And we were kind of worried about that in the fall um, for COVID that people in the Western part of the United States may see a spike due to increased wildfire prevalence. Cigarette smoke also does, as well as potentially uh, diesel and car exhaust. We know that air pollutants like uh, uh, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, diesel exhaust, particulate matter, and biomass smoke have been shown to impair different aspects of response to viral infection. But cigarettes in particular are really interesting because they've, been sho they've shown um, to increase risk to both bacterial and viral infections. So examples are a two to fourfold increased risk of invasive pneumococcal disease. Um, influenza risk is higher and much more severe in smokers compared to non-smokers, as well as an increased risk of tuberculosis. But what we really wanted to get out when we started this study that I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes is what, what about this response to e-cigarettes? 
I mean, everybody talks about e-cigarettes as a potential alternative to smoking, but is it the same? So do we get the same um, response or risk for two and viral infection with e-cigarette use, or is it very different? And I know that you've talked previously with um, Elise and a couple of other speakers about how the components of e-cigarettes are quite different from cigarette smoke. But I'm gonna tell you a little bit more today that hopefully will show you that the response to e-cigarettes um, in terms of response to viral infection is also pretty different. Uh, there are aspects that are very similar, but the response in general um, is, is more different than I would have thought when we initially started this study. So what do we know from previous findings in the nose, which is our model um, in this particular study about tobacco products? So we know that um, a model of influenza infection resulted in a blunted immune response and enhanced markers of viral infection in the nose and cigarette smokers. And that was from a study that came out in 2011 and 2012. We know that in cigarette smokers, there's a reduced recruitment and activation of immune cells, as well as decreased levels of key signaling molecules. And those are the cytokines and chemokines that I told you would come up again um, to orchestrate against, uh, again, orchestrate your defense against infection. And more recently, uh, after I joined this group, we found that the gene expression of important immune response is known to change in cigarette smokers, but that, and that some of these changes overlap in e-cigarette users. However, immunosuppression or genes related to immune response were suppressed more greatly in e-cigarette users, but also the number of genes affected was greater in e-cigarette users. And that study came out in 2016. So for this particular study, we wanted to utilize this model of influenza infection that I mentioned up here. And some of you may have heard of it, especially if you have young kids that really don't like injections. Um, there is an influenza vaccine that's called a flu mist, and that's administered through the nose. And it's um, a live attenuated influenza vaccine, which means that the flu virus that's utilized is alive, but it's adapted to where it can only replicate at cooler temperatures than what's present in your lungs. So the virus will really only replicate in your nose, which is um, the temperature that it needs in order to, to survive. And that's been adapted in a lab. So this live attenuated um, influenza virus vaccine is milder typically in inducing responses and it won't uh, influence or cause overt lower lung uh, illness, which is really important and why we can utilize it as a vaccine. But it also makes a great model to study because it's a live virus and we can look at how it replicates in the nose. So for this study, we recruited non-smokers as well as smokers and e-cigarette users. And we collected lots of nasal samples and all of those are shown here. So nasal lavage, where we spray a bunch of um, saline on someone's nose and ask them to gently expel it into a sample cup. And so we get lots of mucus to look at. Um, we take cells using these uh, curettes and we collect those cells and can use them for gene expression analysis. And we also collect um, epithelial lining fluid, which is the top layer of mucus that sits right on your epithelial cells on these special matrices that are shown here. And so all of this is really nice because um, it's fairly easy to collect. It's not super painful or invasive. And so we can get a lot of um, participation from members of our community, which is really important to look at. So what we're expecting, um, I'm showing this graph from an older study, but it really ni it nicely illustrates what we kind of are expecting in response to a virus, viral infection. So on this y-axis, we're showing um, HA RNA, which is a subunit of influenza virus. And so when you're infected, we typically are expecting a spike um, in the amount of virus that we're detecting from these samples, which means that the virus is replicating in your nose. And along the x-axis, you can see the day of infection, which is marked with LAIV. And as you go along the number of study days, uh, the response to the virus we can look at through a marker of viral infection, which is the amount of this particular mRNA that's present in the nose. Um, so the controls are labeled in black. In this study, we also looked at secondhand smokers, which is in blue, and the red are in smokers. So the controls kind of demonstrate what we typically see, 
we see a little spike um, on day one of the virus replication using this LAAV model. And then it comes back down on day two and kind of levels off to day nine. In secondhand smokers, we saw something very similar. But in smokers, we saw a really huge spike in the amount of um, virus or markers of viral replication that we saw. And then it never really leveled off until almost day 10. And so this tells us that smokers in this case seem to be more susceptible to viral infection because the virus sticks around longer and replicates longer and potentially causes more damage within the airway because each time it replicates and um, enters a new cell, it's basically taking out those cells. So for this study, we wanted to kind of replicate this prior study. We recruited subjects. On a screening day, we collected a lot of medical history information, a smoking and vaping diary, so we knew exactly what they were using. And we took quite a bit of baseline samples. We then waited three to four weeks, um, and then we assigned them to a particular tobacco use group after we got their diaries back. And then we collected some more samples and uh, completed the inoculation with the uh, live attenuated influenza virus. Following infection, we then observed these three groups of smokers, vapors, and non-smokers for several days. And we collected samples along the way and we're gonna analyze these samples. Um, most of them, which come from the nasal cavity uh, for various endpoints. And then we're gonna look at them over time. And so we're hoping that something in this diagram over here will be replicated and we'll be able to observe how e-cigarettes fit into this picture that's already been established. So for this study, I told you about our nasal scrape biopsies where we collect cells. We use those for RNA analysis. And so we extracted RNA from the cells that we collected and we analyzed them for genes that were important for um, immune responses. And we compared them between our three groups. We also utilized our um, epithelial lining fluid as well as our nasal lavage and extracted the proteins from those and used ELISAs uh, in order to detect differences in protein content. And primarily our targets were all cytokines and chemokines, which kind of orchestrate that initial response to a viral infection. And we also compared between all of our groups. And this is just a little demonstration of what our ooh, demographics look like. Um, so we have uh, individuals that are a relatively the same age in all of our groups. Our cigarette group was a little bit older um, typically, we find that uh, younger individuals are the ones that are interested in trying e-cigarettes, and so that kind of swayed our age group for the e-cigarette users. We tried uh, to recruit uh, balance in sex, which because sex differences are really interesting to me just scientifically. However, the e-cigarette e users at the time when we completed this study were primarily male, and so we had a hard time recruiting female e-cigarette users. And we also Megan, looked at Megan. We have we're we're going to have to be wrapping up soon, so I just want to give you a couple minute warning, I guess, just so okay. you you know, because I know they want to hear your results. Okay, thanks, Dan. I'll uh, move on from this. Then. Okay. Um, so we also looked at biomarkers of uh, nicotine exposure, which told us for sure whether people were e-cigarette users or cigarette smokers. So what we found um, was really interesting. We looked at flu B, which is very similar to this previous diagram that I showed you. And we saw that in our smokers, we again saw that extra spike in the amount of flu B, which was prevalent um, in our samples. Uh, and then in our e-cigarette users, um, we were a little bit surprised that we kind of saw this uh, slight difference in the amount of viral replication that we saw in these samples. Um, now, none of these are statistically different, uh, so keep that in mind when you're interpreting these results, but we did see interesting trends here, and we're wanting to follow on, up on this in the future, but something that was significant that was super interesting to me is that the development of virus-specific uh, antibodies oh, were different between groups. So in smokers and e-cigarette users, we didn't see any antibody or virus specific antibody development, which is a marker of uh, appropriate immune memory response to this vaccine. Whereas we did see it and we were expecting, uh, you know, an elevated response, uh, um, an elevated level of virus 
specific antibodies in our non-smokers. So as you can see here, this response, this lack of development of virus specific antibodies, which is important for a secondary response to a virus infection when you come in contact with it again, was lower in both of these groups, which suggests to me that in both um, immune memory is potentially impaired. So this is a big, big data set. Um, but basically what I wanna show you is that when we looked at gene expression between these three groups, the gene expression response in um, the groups differed by exposure. So there's a summary Venn diagram here, which tells the story nicely. So in, um, there were several hundred genes total that were differentially expressed between these two groups when you compare them to non-smokers. Um, however, there were only uh, about 80 genes that were differentially expressed in the cigarette group but there were um, over 150 genes, you know, 190, uh, one to be exact, that were differentially expressed in e-cigarette users. And as you can see here, most of these immune genes, this 160, were suppressed. So we're not getting an adequate response to this virus in e-cigarette users, which is really important kind of take home message here. Um, and I can share these slides uh, with Dana and she can pass them around if you want to dig into this data a little more. But um, these two other graphs show all the differences compared to non-smokers in graph B. And you can see that um, at the bottom, it shows that the non-smokers here are mostly in red, whereas we're seeing more suppressed response in the blue in the e-cigarette e group especially, but also somewhat in the cigarette smokers. And then in C, this is all, these are all of the genes that overlap uh, between e-cigarette users and cigarette smokers that were differentially expressed. And it's those uh, 50 genes in the middle of the Venn diagram. But again, we're seeing that response where non-smokers are mostly red and you see an elevated response of immune genes to a virus, which is important. You want that, right? Whereas in the e-cigarettes and the cigarette smokers, you don't see that elevated immune response to a viral virus infection. Um, and then here, we're just showing very similar patterns, but this is protein. Um, you see a lower response in D, E, and F. Uh, from e-cigarette users, you don't see um, elevated production of IL-6, of IL-12, P40, or interferon gamma, um, whereas you do in non-smokers in some cases, and in, in it's extra elevated in cigarette smokers um, in some cases as well. So the overall conclusions for all of this is that e-cigarette use is associated with significant suppression of normal respiratory defenses and markers of immune memory in the context of this experimental respiratory virus infection. An immune response to virus in e-cigarette users is different than in cigarette smokers when you compare them to non-smokers. So overall, um, e-cigarette use may suppress or may increase susceptibility to poor immune response to viral infection similar to other air pollutants. Those specific responses can vary by pollutant type. So that's um, a great example here where in cigarette smokers we saw less immune suppression and fewer genes affected than in the e-cigarette group. Um, and this is really, I'm gonna go through this really quick. So what do we know about va vaping and COVID? Um, and so the answer is, we don't know a whole lot, but we're learning more. Um, so really early in the pandemic, and this is in March, this is right at the start of the pandemic, there were people making lots of wild guesses about how people may respond, especially e-cigarette users to COVID. So uh, Bill de Blasio is saying here that there's a 22 year old man, he's in the hospital. Um, and why is he in the hospital if he's young? And Bill de Blasio, de Blasio posits that maybe it's because he's a vapor, whereas there's another you know, talking head here that suggests that vaping uh, prevents people from getting COVID, which uh, really early in the pandemic, I don't know if you could say for a fact, but there have been more investigations done, and these are in August and December, where links between vaping and COVID have been identified. So people who vape um, have a higher risk of COVID than their peers who don't vape. And that was a study from Stanford. Um, and then a study that uh, supports the possibility that vaping increased risks um, and that vaping might increase the spread of coronavirus even because of how much um, vaping, people who vape share vape devices, which is really interesting. And then um, there's some information also about vaping and other pathogens. And I just wanted to share that briefly uh, where there's evidence that uh, communicable diseases 
uh, can be impacted by sharing these electronic cigarettes. And that's really well shown in this study, in, in this uh, news article here, where they identified 13 confirmed cases of mumps at Elon University after uh, a bunch of people had been sharing vape devices. Um, E-cigarettes also have been shown to increase susceptibility to bacterial infection in a, in a rodent model, as well as in a human study where they affect neutrophil uh, function and phagocytosis and net formation, which you may have heard about from Phil uh, Clapp. And then um, this study in particular uh, found that gum disease or infection can be increased by almost double in people who use e-cigarettes versus non-smokers. And that's because they think it alters the oral microbiome, which is super interesting. And so with that, I'd be happy to answer questions that you guys have. And I just wanted to thank everyone who was involved at UNC, as well as our collaborators at UCSF, and then for all of our funding agencies. Um, and I can take questions. So I can see some of them here. Let's see. Thanks, Megan. I think some of the teachers may need to go. So I think okay. Dana, Dana may just wrap up quickly, just tell them what comes next after the series, and then maybe we can go back to Q&A. Sure, that's sounds. fine. Yeah, I do know a few of you need to leave. We're supposed to wrap up now. Um, and maybe Megan can take a look at the questions while I just share um, one final screen with you all since um, I know you have questions. Um, so this does conclude our series. And I wanted to let you know that Elise and I are going to be um, holding an office hour March 25th from 4 to 5 p.m. for anyone who wants to join us and just talk about you know, what they learn, how they're incorporating the lessons. It's just an opportunity to check in. It's completely optional, but we, we will be there and I will send a reminder with the Zoom link as that gets closer. And then a couple things since you, since the series is coming to an end, um, next week I will be emailing each of you a certificate of completion documenting your total number of hours. Many of you have participated in all four sessions and we really appreciate that. Um, You'll be getting a participation stipend of up to $150, depending on the extent to which you participated. Um, also, we are going to be providing an additional stipend for anyone who's interested in conducting and providing feedback about one of the lessons. So either the first two lessons or the digital interactive notebook. Um, I'll be sending out more information about that. And then also I'll send out a link to request materials for that biomarker simulation activity. So all this to say, uh, that early next week, um, be, be on the lookout for an email from me with all of this information, links to forms, et cetera. And um, just be sure you read that. And I'll also send out an email tomorrow with a link to the evaluation, which I did place into the chat. But we really would love for you to evaluate this session. There's a couple extra questions this time because it's our final session. Uh, so thanks so much. For doing that and I'm going to turn it back over if you have to leave please feel free to step away but Megan will stay on for a few more minutes and we'll stay here as well for those of you who have questions um let's see do you want to at least do you have a question you want to kick us off with for Megan um, let's see. so it looks like um we'll just go in order for now um the question is about with the immune memory so when we're measuring the different antibodies is that for the whole body or just the respiratory tract that's a great question. Um, so when we think about immune memory, uh, we typically think about white blood cells coming in from the circulation and um, identifying and communicating with the cells that are local to the respiratory tract. But those cells then have to take um, whatever signals that they pick up or identifying factors of these viruses back to the lymph nodes in order to communicate this um, immune memory, right? And so all of that is involved with kind of a whole body response and it's not local to the respiratory tract per se, but um, if your respiratory tract did come in contact with the virus again, uh, the response could be localized to the airway when it deals with that pathogen and sends signals to the rest of the body to say, you know, we've seen this before, <laughs> we know what to do, come and deal with this virus, right? Um, so it's, it's kind of a two-pronged system. It's identified in the respiratory tract, but it's definitely a more whole body immune response rather than just localized. Cool. All right. Next question. So are there key genes where over or under expression in response to infection is more important or biologically meaningful than other ones? 
That is a really complex question. Um, so that's something that we're, we deal with every day when we're looking at toxicants. So we really need to identify, you know, what level of response is biologically meaningful, right? And we kind of arbitrarily set that at twofold uh, for some of our experiments, but we know um, for other mediators that it can be even just a very slight, like half fold increase in response that can be biologically meaningful. Um, but we do know that there are a subset of cytokines and chemokines, as well as activation of certain immune types that are super specific to responding to viral infection. And so the ones that we typically target that we know are important for this initial response are uh, interleukin-6, um, IP10, um, and the interferon responses. So the whole family, like interferon, gamma, alpha, beta, lambda, um, all of those are some of the ones that we typically look at pretty closely. And the, some of those are included in the protein diagrams that I ran through really quickly. And I apologize for that. All right. A um, couple more questions. Um, one is about how closely does, does gene change relate to meaningful protein change? Yeah, that's a great question. I had a hidden slide in uh, that I took out right before this presentation, um, but it demonstrates that most of the gene expression that's paralleled in protein that we look at are really well correlated. So typically, if we're seeing changes in gene expression, we're also seeing a matched change in protein. Cool. All right, last question. Um, do you know how e-cigarettes are altering gene expression? Is there a specific chemical that's altering gene expression? That's a great question. Um, so one of the common chemicals that are between cigarettes and e-cigarettes is nicotine. And nicotine, there have been some cases where nicotine has been shown to alter gene expression. And so that's probably the common chemical that may be altering between these two products. But in e-cigarettes in particular, there's some evidence that some of the aldehydes that Elise has mentioned prior um, in flavoring components may drive some of these responses, especially in impaired uh, neutrophil and macrophage response, as well as natural killer cells. Um, but there's also components that are created through the heating of all of these products that we really don't understand very well and how they might influence a response to a viral infection. So that's a really long say, a really long way of saying, and we're not really sure, <laughs> but it's something that we're actively working on. Yeah. So I think that's it. There was one earlier question that was during your talk that had to do with our immune genes that are suppressed different from those with ESA use. But I think you went into that, that you do see different changes in, in all three groups. So I think that one you already answered. Great. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any remaining questions, feel free to ask them or to contact us or Megan, if you think of any others, we're always happy to answer questions. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, you so much, Megan, us. for being here.